turn to it, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I would like for you to open your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, uh, and follow along with me here because I'm going to do some expository preaching, expository teaching. What does that mean? So I'm just going to walk you down the scriptures, right? I'm just going to share these scriptures, and then I will elaborate on this portion of the scripture, and then elaborate on that another portion of the scripture, and we'll go down and cover these few verses of scripture. Now, there'll be a lot of other scriptures incorporated within, but this is the context, right? Second Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm, I'm going to start in verse 7. So, Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 19, he said, go ye into all the world and teach. So in our preaching, we want to make sure that Sunday morning or whenever we preaching, it's also teaching, right? Preaching is to proclaim the word of God, but in the proclamation and delivering uh, the proclamation or proclaiming the word of God, we also must teach, right? We don't want you just to go through the motions and hear and say, oh, that was a good service and that was this and that was that. We want you to learn something, right? Learn to grow your relationship in God. Learn to develop a walking, a living, a alive relationship with your Savior, Jesus Christ. Learn to be a witness for him. Learn that you are an overcomer through Christ. Learn that no weapon formed against you shall prosper because you are in Christ. Learn that there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ, who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. So we want you to learn. In order for you to learn, we must teach, right? Excuse me just a moment. There must be teaching. So there must be teaching in the midst of preaching. Amen. Praise God. So that's what we want you to do. And that's how we approach uh, the word of God. Amen. All right. So expository, that's the purpose of expository preaching, expository teaching. So that when you go back to the word of God and your personal devotions, you can walk through those scriptures, right? Because oftentimes, brothers and sisters, uh, last week uh, after doing service, I was having lunch and I I was having lunch in this uh, little storefront area, you know, a little hamburger joint. I was just wanted some zucchini. So I got some zucchini and there was a little storefront church over there and it started at one o'clock. And I said, you know, I'm just going to stop and I like to visit and, and hear. I like to hear other ministers preach and um, just, I have a heart for people. I don't care what congregation you're a part of, what fellowship you're a part of. We've all been created in the image and the likeness of Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, there's only one God, one Lord, one Savior, one baptism, Ephesians chapter four, right? And God loves us all. So I like to just kind of participate, listen, or do whatever. And anyway, I'm saying that to say the preacher did everything but preach the Bible. He never read from the Bible. The music was gone. And I said, okay, I'm a, I understand this is a part of the church culture. So I stayed 30 minutes, 40 minutes. This kept going on, 45 minutes. Then he, he opened his Bible, but then he closed it. And I guess what they call him today, his armor bearer came and grabbed the Bible. So I'm like, oh, he's not going to read. He never read from the Bible. He never used any scriptures. Then he started going around and then the whole going through the motions and two hours. I stayed there two hours because I had a call at three o'clock, a prayer call at three o'clock. So I said, I have to go. But this went on for two hours from one o'clock to about 2.50, 2.55 and I got him and they said, oh, just wait a few more minutes. We're going to say, I got other things to do. And I was thinking, there was about 50 people in there, 50, 60 people. And I'm thinking, they just went two hours. There was no reading from the Bible. And I'm not finding fault. I'm just sharing this reality with you. There was no reading from the Bible. 
There was no scriptural references. There was no teaching that the people could incorporate and apply in their lives so that after that service, when they go home, when they go on the job, et cetera, and I was thinking, okay, we're back to pre-COVID. I believe God was trying to get the church's attention, I mean, in in that, in the during the pandemic, that was an opportunity for the churches to congregations, the preachers, the ministers, the church leadership to say, you know what? We need to get in alignment with God, right? And really look at what we're doing and what we're not doing. So that was just my opinion on that. But anyway, they didn't do anything, right? So it went two hour and 50, 55 minutes that I was there and there was no preaching to, there was no there was preaching, there was proclamation of this, and God is laying upon, and I don't want to go through because I don't want to sound like I'm finding fault, but there's 12 people in here that need to sow a seed and going through all that, but there was no teaching, there was no scripture reference, there was none, and I said, oh God, the people are without, the people are without, so anyway, that challenges me to even more so be sure that Yes, I'm going to preach, I'm going to proclaim, but I want to teach, right? I don't want to just preach the emotions of Doug Perkins. I don't want to just preach what I feel. That's not going to necessarily help you in your life. I want to preach, teach, and direct you to God's word because it's God's words that's going to help you establish a relationship, maintain a relationship, develop your relationship in Christ as we navigate this world, as we navigate this world. So let's get into God's word. And today I want to speak to you on the title of the thought, yes, but no, and then the why. Very odd message title, right? But we're going to put it together with the help of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I know Jesus loves us and I know his word doesn't go out and return void. And the third part, God laid it up on my heart and I was thinking about it and I said, God, do you want me to put it together? So he's going to help me. He's already helped me and he's going to help me because he loves me and he loves you, the hearers, and he wants you to learn and be able to incorporate what is shared from his word in your lives. All right, so here we go. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So what he's referring to is the gospel, the good news, this treasure. The gospel, the good news is a treasure. And brothers and sisters, we have it. We have the gospel, the good news that the world needs to hear. I know we just had our election season and uh, uh, there were some people that were happy concerning the presidential uh, campaign and election. There were many people that were upset Nevertheless, within the Christian community, we serve God, we look to God, and we pray for all men and women, as the Bible tells us. And I preach to you about it. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. Uh, verse First Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, right? Pray for all men. But some people, even in the Christian community, really struggle and have a problem with that. And um, how we overcome our feelings and our emotions is that we rely on the word of God and realize that regardless of the outcome, be it on the national level, the presidential campaign, the Congress, uh, men and women who were elected, and uh, the senators, all the way down to the state level, the various propositions passing or not passing, um, the local officials elected or non-elected, regardless of all those outcomes, we keep our eyes 
on Jesus Christ, because the Bible lets us know that as we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, looking unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, he's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. Also, Romans 8, 28, the Bible says, for we know God will, God can, and God will work all things together for our good. So we stand on the word of God. We stand, brothers and sisters, on the promises of God that he's made to us, all right? So we stand on this treasure that we have that's called the gospel, all right? So verse seven, we have this treasure in our earthen vessels, this vessel. That's what the body is, a vessel that carries the soul and the spirit, that houses the soul and the spirit, and houses the gospel, right? That the excellency, so what's the purpose of having this treasure? That the excellency of the power of God may be, the power may be of God and not of us. So we are to lift up Jesus, the excellency, the excelling, continuously excelling of the gospel of the good news may be of God and not us. It doesn't matter how many uh, academic degrees that I may acquire or the title in front of my name, Dr. Doug Perkins. Those things do not matter. What matters is that the treasure that's within this earthen vessel that's in my heart, that's in my mind, that I relay this good news, this treasure to men and women that they may know Jesus Christ, right? It may, the power may be of God and not of us. So we don't, we don't take any glory from God. Let's go on. Verse eight, we are troubled on every side. Yet, not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9, persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the Lord Jesus Christ. The, always bearing about in the body, in this vessel, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. I read two verses, I put them together, verse 10 and verse 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, all right? So I want to speak to you today, just for a little bit, I want to speak to you on the title, on the thought, yes, but no. And then the why. Yes, but no. And then the why. Very interesting title. Very interesting thought behind the title. Let me share this before I go any further. As a believer in Christ, we cannot afford to be, and we should not be, naive. I have encountered many people who are naive to things in life, naive to the ways of the world, the streets, naive on the job, naive within the family units, naive uh, to spouses, naive to children, to their children, just on and on and on. Brothers and sisters, 
within Christianity, we really cannot afford to be naive. And, and be passive in various areas. Nor can we be self-denying, right? Or in denial as a believer. And I'll explain some of these things where I'm going with this. So we really have to be aware that we're not naive to certain things or have a passive attitude or a passive mindset concerning dealing with people be it in the family or in the church or just in life in general, nor in denial or self-denying as believers. Self-denial to the, the troubles and the tribulations and the, and the things that this life brings about, this world brings about in our lives. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the way of a transgressor is hard. So those who do not live for Christ, the Bible explicitly tells us that that life is challenging. That life is hard. Hold on. Don't be naive just to that side, because Jesus said in the New Testament, in John chapter 16, verse 33, he said to us believers, so don't be naive. He said to us believers, and don't deny this truth. Jesus said, in John 16, 33, in the world, this world that we're all living in, this world that we just came through a, a, an election cycle, that the outcomes were not necessarily in our favor, in some favor and not in others' favor. He said, in the world, you will suffer tribulation. These are the words of Jesus. You will suffer tribulation. You will suffer adversity. You will suffer. You will have challenges. You will have hurdles you need to overcome. There will be obstacles in your way as you're navigating through this world. Please, brothers and sisters, as I speak to you today, do not allow yourself to be a naive Believer, naive believers make themselves vulnerable to be taken advantage of. Naive and believers who are in denial to the troubles and the challenges that this world brings to all of our lives set themselves up for failure, brothers and sisters. So please, please, please be aware the Bible tells us to walk circumspectly or knowing, being aware of our surroundings as we walk, as we live, being aware of your uh, atmosphere, being aware of those in your presence, being aware of what's going on in your households, being aware of the attacks of the enemy, being aware of the spiritual battles that we all encounter. People always talk about spiritual warfare, but be aware that we can flee the very appearance of evil. Don't allow yourself to be sucked in to a place where you are tempted, you're tried, a place where you're vulnerable to the tricks and the lies of the devil. Please do not be naive. The Bible says, Paul said, that we are not ignorant, writing to the church in Corinth, we are not ignorant to the devil's devices. The devil has so many devices that he uses on the believers to try to trip us up. He, he used some of those devices on Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. So I'm not just speaking and firing from the hip. I'm speaking and I'm sharing the word of God with you. And I share the word of God over and over and over all these many years as God speaks to my heart so that we will not be naive believers, Christians, so that we will not be in denial to ourselves, to our loved ones, that, oh no, they wouldn't go through that. that God would protect them from that. Do not be naive or in denial to the truths that in the world 
there is tribulation, that in the world, there is hard times and hardships. Brothers and sisters, please do not set yourself up for failure through denial or being naive. Accept the truth for what it is and realize that God will never leave us nor forsake us. I'm a little ahead of myself here, but let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and let's look at what the Apostle Paul is writing in the second letter to the church in Corinth. He said, and I talked about this already, he said, we have this treasure, this gospel the Holy Scriptures, the knowledge of God. We have the Word of God in earthen vessels. God has blessed us, privileged us. He's blessed us and given us His Word, privileged us to be able to understand His Word through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the excellency of the power of God, that the power may be of God. So you and I, we have this power to navigate life and be conquerors and be overcomers and be encouraged. And it's not of ourselves, it's of God, right? It's this excelling power that helps us to excel throughout life in the midst of all that we go through in this world. So Paul says, we have this treasure. I want that to be instilled in your mind as I speak today, you have this treasure, you have the gospel, you have the access to the power of God uh, because God has blessed you with it. So then he goes on and Paul goes on. So we have this treasure in earth and vessels. True. Let that be established. Let that be a known fact. Why? Because in this world, there's tribulation. In this world, there's hardship. So he goes on and he says, we are troubled. So even with this treasure within us, it doesn't negate the fact that there's still trouble, brothers and sisters. There's still trouble that we all face at times in our lives. He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. So let's look at that as we look at the title of today's message. Yes, we are troubled. Yes, there are trials. Yes, there is tribulation. Yes, there are challenges in this world. Yes, there are obstacles. Yes, there are hurdles. Yes, there are problems and temptations that we face on a daily level in our lives, but no, we're not distressed because of those trials, brothers, sisters. Yes, there are trials. Yes, there are tribulations. Yes, there are adversities, but no, we're not distressed because of them. We're not stressed out because of them. We're not pressed beyond measure because of them. Why, why? Let's go to the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. He said, God is faithful. So yes, there are tribulations. Yes, there are trials. No, we're not distressed because God is faithful. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And he will not suffer or he will not allow you and I to be tempted, to be tried beyond that which we are able. But with every temptation, hear me out, with every temptation, with every trial, with every challenge, with every obstacle, with every hurdle, God, the Bible says, will make a way of escape. Brothers and sisters, yes, we go through trials, but no, we're not distressed. Why? Because God will always make a way of escape for you and I. Stand on the word of God. Stand on the promises of God. Don't be naive. Don't be in denial. Accept 
what's coming your way. Yes, it's coming my way, but no, I will not respond to it the way the world wants me to respond to it because why God has made a way of escape. God is faithful. So we have the yes and we have the no and we have why? Because God has made a way of escape. And why? Because we stand on the promises of God. Let's move forward. He said, we are perplexed. Yes. Yes, we are perplexed. What does that word mean? It means we're bewildered at times. We're completely baffled at times as we navigate life in this world. We're puzzled, right? What's going on? Can't figure it out. Perplexity. But no, we're not in despair because of the perplexity. We're not in despair. What does this word despair mean? The word despair means to suffer from anxiety. Despair is defined as to suffer from anxiety. or sorrow, or pain. So he said, yes, we are perplexed. We are baffled at times. We are puzzled, but we're not in despair. We're not going to allow anxiety to overtake us. We're not going to allow anxiety to dominate our lives. Why? Because in Philippians 4, 6, so I'm associating the why with scriptures. Why? Because in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he tells us, be careful for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, brothers and sisters, let your requests be made known unto God. So when there's when you're puzzled, when you're baffled, when you're be in a state of bewilderment, when you're perplexed in your mind. No, don't, don't allow despair to govern and rule your life. Don't allow anxiety to begin to govern and control your day. Why? Because you can go to God, brothers and sisters. Philippians 4, 6. Everything, every situation, every circumstance, Every situation that you find yourself in or your loved ones in or someone who's confiding in you in, everything by prayer and earnest supplication, fervency, intensity, with thanksgiving, thank God that he's brought it to your attention. Thank God that you can trust in him and you can pray. Let your request be made known unto God. Why do we not get uh, suffer anxiety to the point it controls us where we have to go on medication? Because we have the why. We have the answer to the why. Why is because we can go to God and we can lay our concerns at the feet of God. He said in 1 Peter chapter 5, he said, cast your cares upon the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, verse 8. Cast your cares on the Lord because he cares for you. Brothers and sisters, yes, we are perplexed. No, we do not despair. Why? Because we can bring our petitions to the Lord. We can cast our cares on the Lord and we know that he cares for for us. Let's move on. Verse 8 or verse 9. We are persecuted. This is a big one. We are persecuted. You're persecuted. What does that mean? Ill treated. Ill treated for whatever reason. It could be because of one's nationality, one's ethnicity, one's beliefs, one's convictions, one's race, one's economical status, the place where one lives, the neighborhood, your environment, persecuted for all these different reasons, one's gender, male, female. Females are persecuted 
on the job because of their, you know, for, for whatever reasons, their ambitions to rise higher on the job or working in the classrooms, uh, persecuted from their male counterparts, on and on and on and on and on and on. A lot of persecution, a lot of ill treatment. We can all relate to it at some point in our lives. Yes, we are. Don't be naive to the fact that there is no persecution. Yes, there is persecution. And yes, there will always be persecution. But no, we're not forsaken. In the midst of persecution from man and man's systems, we're not forsaken. No, we're not forsaken. This word forsaken means to be abandoned, to be deserted. So when you and I experience persecution from the world that we live in, that we're navigating in on a daily basis, you and I can say, we are not forsaken, we're not deserted, we're not abandoned, and that brings us to the why. Because in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So yes, you are persecuted in the world. Yes, you are ill-treated because of your gender, because of your race because of your education or lack of education, because of the skin of your, uh, the color of your skin, you are persecuted, whatever the reason, you're persecuted even within the religious realm, even within the churches. Uh, you're persecuted because you won't do what the pastor says. You're persecuted because uh, you're not tithing. You're persecuted because someone uh, in the church thinks you're not giving and you should give and you should be able. Persecuted for all these reasons, ill-treated. But brothers and sisters, rest assured, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. He said there in Hebrews chapter 13, I'll never leave you. The world may persecute you, the world will persecute you in every facet, on the job, in the classroom, in the church congregations, in family, there is persecution, there is ill treatment. But Jesus says, I'll always be there with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never abandon you. I'll never desert you. I'll never just leave you by the side of the world. He said, and therefore, read it, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, because we have the why. We can say why to the no. The no is out, we're not forsaken. Jesus said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And therefore, brothers and sisters, as the Bible tells us, we can boldly say, you can boldly say, brothers, you can boldly say, sister, when you've been persecuted, when you've been mistreated, when you've been ill-treated, especially within congregations. That's where it hurts the most. Within these religious organizations, people are ill-treated. People are persecuted. I know I came from an organization, I was in it 22 and a half years, almost 23 years. So many people were ill-treated. I really can't say I was ill-treated. Maybe I was, and maybe I was naive to it. Uh, I was in denial to it, like many of us. Um, you say, well, why did you leave out of it? Because my eyes opened and I, I believe that God wanted me to go in a different direction, like love people versus just loving an organizational name or just loving uh, and being committed and loyal to God versus just men or what have you. So that's different. But I know of many people who were ill-treated. I know many people who were persecuted because they took a stand, because they spoke out, because they weren't in alignment with 
this board member or that pastor or this minister or this minister's wife, and therefore they experience persecution, ill treatment. Uh, but you know what? God, as I speak to them, if I, if I get the opportunity, but God loves you, God cares about you, and Jesus will never leave you. Jesus will never forsake you, regardless of what man says, regardless of what man did. You can always look to Jesus. You can always count on Jesus, and you can always know and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. So yes, we are persecuted, brothers and sisters. I don't want you to be in denial. I don't want you to, or if you're in denial, like I was in denial, I don't want you to be naive like I was naive. And it took me, after my eyes opened to some things, 2007, and I began, the scales began to fall from my eyes, and I, I began to drop that denial. And I didn't want it to just be my emotions, but it was just appearing before me. And after three years or so, and I said, that's it. I'm going to move on. Lord, help me. The Lord is my helper, and the Lord helped me to establish my own nonprofit, religious nonprofit, 501c3. So I wasn't just dependent. He helped me to learn. He helped me to educate myself on an academic level to be able to learn. So brothers and sisters, I'm sharing that, not lifting up myself. I'm sharing that with you to say that when you're persecuted by man, fear not what man can do to you, but look what God has for you. Amen. Look what God has for you for you and began to pursue God and pursue the guiding and the leading and the guiding and the direction that God wants you to go in. Why? Because he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. We're not saved because we're associated with an organization. We're not saved because we're associated with a congregation. We're saved because we confess with our mouth, Romans chapter 10, verse 9, we confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that God the Father raised God the Son from the grave. So we are saved because we confessed it and we believed it that Jesus was resurrected from the grave for our justification. And hence, that's what Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. He said that I might know him, Philippians 3.10, I believe is, and the power of his resurrection. Not that I may know this pastor or that pastor, I'm not putting anyone down, but know them, have a relationship. I want to know Jesus. I want to have a relationship with Jesus because he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never persecute me. Man may persecute you because of personality conflicts, because they view you a certain way. Your skin color, your race, your gender, whatever it might be, may lead men, even in the clergy, to persecute, to discriminate, to to do various things, but why are we not forsaken? You believe in your heart because Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus will always be there to help you, brothers and sisters. So we can boldly, with confidence, say, the Lord is my helper, regardless of what I experience, regardless of what the doctor says, regardless of the physical disability I may have, regardless of the infirmity that may be vexing my body, the Lord is still my helper. I will not fear what men will do to me. I will not fear what men shall say to me because my eyes, your eyes should be fixed on the Lord. We should look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So brothers and sisters, in verse 9, 2 Corinthians 4 and 9, we are, yes, we are persecuted. No, we're not forsaken. Why? Because the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And the Bible says that we can boldly say that he is our helper. Last one. He said, Cast down, but not destroy. Yes, we're cast down at times. Absolutely. We are cast down. We feel down. We feel low. We don't have 
Uh, there are times within the day that they're just not good times, good hours or whatever, good moments in the day. But we're not destroyed. We're not destroyed, brothers and sisters. Understand that. I've been cast down, but I'm not destroyed. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. They would have to destroy Jesus in us, which is an impossibility for us to be destroyed. So greater, in, greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And the God who is for you and I is the same God who's given us the spiritual arsenal, the spiritual weapons for you and I to be overcomers. Paul said in Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 31, he said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Then in Romans chapter 38, uh, 28, excuse me, chapter 8, Going into the verses 30, he says, what shall separate us? So we may be cast down, but what shall separate, what shall destroy us completely? Shall tribulation, shall pearl, shall the sword, shall abandonment, shall all these things that man do to us separate us, destroy us? He said, no, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, for we are more than conquerors through him who loved us and are called through him who loved us, brothers and sisters. Yes, we experience adversity in the world as I go back down through here. Yes, we are troubled. Yes, we are perplexed. Yes, we are persecuted. Yes, we are cast down. But no, we're not distressed. No, we're not in despair. No, we are not forsaken. No, we are not destroyed. Why? Because God is faithful. Why? Because God will always make a way of escape. Why? Because we can petition before God. We don't have to experience anxiety. We don't have to allow anxiety to dominate us. But in everything we can pray. But why? Because he'll never leave us nor forsake us so that we may boldly say the Lord is our helper. But why are we not destroyed? Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Brothers and sisters, as I conclude, verse 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. So we have the yes, we're not naive, we're not in denial to the troubles that life brings. Oh, boy. Uh, yes, accept it, realize it, acknowledge it, but then say to yourself, no, I'm not going to succumb to it. All right? Yes, realize it's there, acknowledge it. But then say, no, I'm not going to succumb to it. I'm not going to allow it to govern my life, govern my day, dictate my day. No, 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 no. And we can say no because of the why. Why? Because God is faithful. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Why? Because we can pray about everything. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Why? Because Hebrews 3, verse 5, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Why? Because of 1 John chapter 4. Greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. And therefore, verse 10, knowing that why, having that why solidified in our hearts and in our minds, we always bear about in our body, in this vessel, the dying of the Lord of Jesus. We are dead with Christ. We are buried with Christ, Romans chapter 6. So that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. So yes, we are dead with Christ. We died with Christ. 
but also as we walk, as we live, brothers and sisters, we manifest the life of Christ in us. And that's what people want to see. That's what they're looking for. That's what your family member's looking for. That's what your child's looking for. The life of Jesus being manifested in us and through us. So yes, we go through battles. We face trials. Yes, we're not in denial to these truths, these facts of living in this world. But no, we don't succumb to them. Because why? We have the word of God in us. We have the truth in us. We have the overcomer in us. We have in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I believe it is, God always causes us to triumph in Jesus Christ. The truth always prevails. So yes, but no, and we have the why. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we thank you. We praise you and we glorify you. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to share your word. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to speak truth and to speak life into your people. And I pray, God, if there's, there are those, not if, there are those on the other end of my voice Ears who are hearing, I pray, Lord, that they would allow the Holy Spirit to minister to them and to pull them to you, Jesus. I pray that every believer on here would allow the Holy Spirit to make the words that they just heard today crystal clear, bring spiritual clarity that we may not walk in a state of denial to what the world bring towards our life. That we may say yes in acknowledgement to the trials, to the tribulations, to the hurdles, to the obstacles. But I also pray that as we acknowledge and we say yes to the challenges and difficulties that we face in life, we also have that spiritual clarity where we say, but no, I will not live a life of despair. But no, I will not live a life as if God has abandoned me and forsaken me and deserted me. No, I will not live a life of distress and stress and anxiety. No, I will not live a life of defeatism, cast down. Because why? And I pray that our why is standing on the promises of God. Standing on what God has given us and said to us. Brothers and sisters, we have the yes, but also no. And the why is the word of God. The why is the solution. The why is the answer. And it's the why that our faith is dependent upon. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. I pray, Lord, that men and women would open their eyes, open their minds to you, regardless of the outcomes of the world that's before us, regardless of situations and things that we all face, we would stand on your word and allow your word to be our truth because we know that when we know the truth, the truth makes us free. Thank you, Lord, for your love, for your goodness, and your blessings in each one of our lives. Keep a hedge of protection around each of us, Lord, as we go throughout the day. Until we meet again, I pray that you help us to show men and women your love, not only for us, but also for them. This I pray in your wonderful name, Christ, and we say amen.